So with that, I think we'll get started. It's a little afternoon. Um, thank you all so much for joining us right now. Um, my name is Nora Carlos and I'm the Education Engagement Manager at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And um, welcome to Online Watershed Learning or CBF OWL. Now, I don't know about you all, I'm sitting from my home in Richmond, Virginia, and it's a beautiful October day. The sun is shining, and typically our educators would be out in the field learning with teachers and students. Um, maybe we'd be paddling on the Susquehanna River, out on a boat on the Chesapeake Bay, um, studying water quality, looking at macroinvertebrates, um, but obviously we're not outside today. Um, and as you know, that's not the case of what's happening with us this fall. So just like all of you, we have pivoted and adjusted to meet the evolving needs um, of teachers and educators across the watershed. So um, what that means for us is online watershed learning. So our educators today are going to share with you a sample OWL. Um, so we are going to focus on fish adaptations today. Um, so we want you all to use this hour to sit in the chairs of students. Um, so ask questions, um, absorb some new content, and um, hopefully gain some new knowledge from our expert educators here. Um, before I introduce our panelists, is anybody watching at home with their family? Um, maybe this is your lunch break. Um, we hope that maybe um, for any students that are learning at home, um, if they're not in the room with you, have them join in. Um, we'd love for this to be a family affair today. So um, what I would first like to do is introduce the educators that are going to be leading this OWL today. So first up, we have Morgan Jones, and Morgan is our Port Isabel West manager and educator. So Port Isabel is one of our island residential centers located on the Tangier Sound, right smack in the middle of the bay on Virginia's eastern shore. So welcome, Morgan. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, up next, we have O'Shea Bynum, and O'Shea is our Potomac River Environmental Education Assistant Manager and Educator, um, and he's calling in from Maryland. And finally, we have Chris Belisis, and she is our Philip Merrill Environmental Education Assistant Manager and Educator, and she's calling in from the Annapolis, Maryland area as well. So thank you all again for joining. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our three educators to get us started, but please know um, we really would love for you all to um, participate, to send questions, comments in the chat. We're gonna be monitoring them. Um, so buckle up, get ready, and um, we'll see you all um, soon. Morgan, take it away. Thank you, Nora, for introducing us. And just as a quick little introduction to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, if you're not already familiar, um, we are the largest independent conservation organization dedicated to preserving the Chesapeake Bay. So this entire estuary and this watershed, we are really passionate about, we love teaching about, and it's really important for us to save the bay. And so Chesapeake Bay Foundation does that in a variety of ways. So we do that through education, which we're doing right now, um, but also going into schools and teaching school uh, children the online watershed learning lessons. Um, we also do this through restoration efforts. So planting trees, putting oysters back in the bay, things like that. And finally litigation, if we have to, going into the courtrooms and holding others accountable. So this is a really neat estuary and the watershed is huge, 64,000 square miles, six states in that watershed, around 20 million people and 3,000 species of plants and animals. So really unique watershed, really unique estuary. Um, we love teaching about the Chesapeake Bay. And so with that being said, we want to get started with our fish adaptations lesson. And um, before we get started, a few logistical pieces, we'll be asking questions throughout this webinar. And if you all could put those answers in the chat, that would be great. And then lastly, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. And if you could put any questions you have in that Q&A box that is down at the bottom of your screen, that would be great. So to get started, um, fish are a huge part of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. They're a big part of culture and history around the bay, as well as the economy with the fisheries. And so they're kind of all around us in the rivers and the streams and the bay itself. They're around us in the symbols and the meals, the stories and the memories. 
And so with that being said, I wanted to ask all of you, what is your most memorable experience with a fish? So go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, try to keep it to under a sentence, couple words, but what is your most memorable experience with a fish? All right, Morgan, and we are getting some answers coming in. Um, I keep and breed fish. The one that got away, oh, always. <laughs> Taking my daughter fishing for the first time. Uh, kissing a fish on a CDF trip. I remember eating fish and the answers are coming in so fast. I can't read it quite that quickly. Uh, touched a 14 foot hammerhead at nine. Wow, that's awesome. And there's a lot of, lot yeah. of answers. Morgan. <laughs> Great. So um, fish are a huge part of, you know, the stories and the memories we make. We love to see those different memories, um, whether, you know, you're catching one or touching one or eating one. Um, so I want you to take a second and think about that memory you just shared. And is there a specific part or characteristic of the fish that you remember the most? So thinking about that memory, is there a specific part or characteristic of that fish that you remember the most? And as you're putting those in, I'll give an example. Uh, like Nora said, I am an island educator. And so we had a group, it was an all girls school, come out to the islands and it was kind of getting towards dusk. And all of a sudden the water around the entire lodge started breaking and making noises. And so we all ran outside and fish were breaking all around the lodge. All of the girls, some of them had never even fished before, grabbed fishing rods, threw them in the water. They could barely keep the lines in long enough. We were catching rockfish or striped bass. And I really remember the tails of the striped bass really breaking the water. I remember the girls trying to hold the fish by the tail and it was so powerful that they kind of would drop it. Um, so I really remember the tails of the fish. Nice. And some people here remember the tails of their fish too. Uh, specifically, they have how quick it moved, its eyes, the scale, dorsal fin, coloring, the oily fish slipping out of my son's hand, catching perch at my secret place on the Pecos River, the beauty and grace of the jellies. Loving it. Those are all beautiful answers. We love it. Um, and it's great that you all remember some certain characteristics of the fish as well. And so that's actually a perfect segue into our lesson because a lot of those characteristics are actually adaptations. So I'm gonna hand it over to O'Shea for those adaptations. Thanks, Morgan. Um, so like Morgan said, uh, a lot of these characteristic, characteristics you guys are, in fact, naming are adaptations. Um, so what is adaptation? Adaptation is, the process of change physically over time that helps a living organi organism survive. Um, in this case, fish. So just like humans, uh, you adapt, say you're playing a sport, football, basketball, baseball, ballerina, um, you adapt your body to that, that aspect of what you're doing. So for fish, how this happens is through natural selection. Natural selection um, happens when an organism adapts to their environment. Um, as they adapt, they, they tend to survive in that environment. And as they survive, they produce more offspring. So those traits that help that fish survive, um, they are now passed down to the offspring. And that is that form of adaptation and natural selection. Um, so let's take a dive into how uh, the fish anatomy has helped them survive. Um, so here we have a huge uh, display of a fish. We got a few parts here. And um, I'm gonna go through these uh, parts with you guys. So a lot of these specific adaptations that fish have uh, have to do with their different parts. So here we have a breakdown and I'm gonna kind of compare these parts to a vehicle uh, just so you guys can get a little better understanding of what I'm talking about. Um, so I would like to start with the head. Uh, so on a fish head, they have uh, their mouth, their eyes, their nose, the teeth. Um, this is their forefront. Uh, so comparing this to a car, you think about it, you have your headlights where you see, um, it helps you see, uh, you have your grill, um, your hood, everything that kind of protects things from coming in also, is their forefront. Um, next up, we have our caudal fin. This is here in the back. Um, the caudal fin, so the more V-shaped or fork-like uh, this, this, uh, this part of their body is, the faster. So their caudal fin, um, like I said, the more V-shaped it is, the faster it is. So you can kind of compare this to like an engine of a car. The better the engine is, the faster that car is. Um, next up, we, up top, we have our dorsal fins where you have your spines and your rays. Um, these dorsal fins are typically for protection. Uh, they are usually sharp, so for any fish that tries to bite down, or even birds, as you know, birds uh, kind of dive into the water, they try to pick them up. Um, 
they have a great sense of lifting these dorsal fins up, their spines in the race, and using them as a good, good survival technique. Um, they usually stand up and they will usually poke anything that tries to get them. So comparing this to a car, you're probably wondering like what compares to that. Um, think about like a roof of the car. Um, you have your roof for like any, while you're driving, any rain, um, bird feces that fall from the sky, any bugs, that roof is that protection for you. Um, next, you have your pectoral fin, uh, right kind of like right near the head area. Um, the pectoral fin usually helps to control the direction of movement during locomotion. Um, so in a vehicle, just like, just like on a fish in a vehicle, this is more so like the steering wheel. Um, you use that steering wheel to kind of like make sure you're going in the right direction of wherever you're going. Um, next up, you have your anal fin. Uh, this is very important. It usually stabilizes the fish while swimming. So it keeps that perfect balance of the fish. They're not leaning over or they're able to keep that balance. Um, and so for a vehicle, for the, uh, for the comparison for this, uh, look at that as like your tires. So you need all your tires to kind of work together um, and bring it together to even get it to move. So like the anal fin, this is very important for a fish. And, um, last but not least, we have our trunk or form. And this is pretty much the whole body, bringing it all together. Uh, they have their skeleton, their spinal cord, um, skeletal muscles, kidney, everything that brings it together. Um, and obviously, uh, for, for comparing it to a vehicle, it's like the whole body. It brings the whole vehicle together, just like on the fish, brings everything together. Uh, so this is a great um, way to lead into a bo different body shapes with Chris on the next slide. Awesome. Thanks, O'Shea. So yeah, we're going to dive into the different body shapes of these fish, uh, the first adaptation that we'll be covering today. So just by looking at these photos, you can see there's a whole variety of different body types amongst these fish. And maybe I'm being a little partial just because the cow nose ray is probably my favorite bait critter, but we're going to start with the cow nose ray. Uh, this is an incredible fish. They can get up to 50 pounds. They have a wingspan of about three feet. And this nice large form or uh, body shape for them helps them to migrate up north into the bay uh, to give birth and reproduce during the summer. Those wings um, are also really different from your more traditional shaped fish like the sheep's head minnow. Those wings are actually its pectoral fins. And those pectoral fins, in addition to letting it travel longer distances, um, help it to hunt. So when it's hunting for food, it'll go kind of closer towards the bay bottom, hover over its prey, and then flap its wings or its pectoral fins to help unbury those mollusks. So things like razor clams, soft shell clams, and even occasionally oysters too. And another fish that likes to hang out towards the bottom is the hog choker here to the right. So this hog choker, it's kind of a funny looking fish. Um, it's really flat, almost like a pancake. And this adaptation, this body shape is very intentional because it does like to hide in those bottom sediments. So it'll bury itself about halfway. And then both of its eyes are on one side of its body. So with both of its eyes being on one side of its body, it enables it to look out for predators and also to seek out prey as well. Really fascinating fish. Um, and then we have the northern puffer. So this northern puffer is almost like the opposite of the hog choker in that when it feels threatened, it'll quickly inhale either air if it's out of water or water if it's underneath to expand. And this sudden expansion um, makes predators kind of think twice before attacking uh, this northern puffer. And then the last fish I'm gonna talk to you all about is the skillet fish. Uh, but I have a fun surprise. I have one with me right here in my tank. So we're gonna take a break from the slides and take a look. All right, so here we have the skillet fish. You can see it has this awesome suction disc on the bottom um, of this fish on its abdomen and it's clinging on to this tank. Typically in the wild, um, these skillet fish will be clinging on to oyster shells which gives them their other nickname of oyster clingfish. And this fish is amazing because it has this like nice broad flat head and a beautiful modern modeled pattern on the other side. And this helps it to blend in really well with its environment, uh, usually around oyster reefs. And this adaptation of blending in with one's environment is known as camouflage. 
And Morgan's gonna to talk to us more about one type of camouflage next. Thank you, Chris. Um, so just like Chris said, I want to dive deeper into a certain type of camouflage um, that a lot of fish use. And so this type of camouflage um, is called counter shading. And I do not have a fish with me right now. I wish I did, um, but I do have, you know, a pretend cardboard fish to make me feel better. Um, so I do have this guy right here. And so I'm gonna show you how counter shading works. And the way this works is the fish is actually dark on top and then light on the bottom. And so the way this works is I'm gonna demonstrate it. I want you all to pretend that you are predators and you are looking, you're swimming in the water column and you're looking down and the bottom sediments are pretty dark. And so kind of dark like my shirt, the bottom sediments are dark and you're looking down and you see a fish swimming. And because the top of that fish is dark, it kind of starts to blend in with the bottom sediments there. And so that dark top blends in with the bottom sediments and it makes it harder for that predator to see that fish. And then I want you to change your perspective and you are the predator, the bigger fish maybe, swimming along the bottom. And you look up and you see the white side of the fish, the underbelly that's usually white or lighter. And what does this blend into? Well, it actually blends into the sunlight. So if the sun is shining super bright, the white of the fish really blends in with that sunlight there. So just pretending like my flashlight is the sun. So that's a really cool thing that fish use um, camouflage for is that counter shading. And actually a lot of different animals, um, species around the world use counter shading. And it's just a really cool um, way to, you know, hide yourself from the um, environment around you, so. Alrighty, so some other types of camouflage. Um, we do have this northern puffer that's like a great example of counter shading, dark on top, light on the bottom. Um, so there's just a live example of that there. But another type of camouflage is a false eye spot. So that false eye spot is when a fish has kind of a spot on it somewhere that's larger and it really looks like an eye. And so it's either here behind the head or maybe even on the tail. And this confuses the predator because the predator can't really tell where this fish begins or ends. So they're looking at the fish, they can't really see where its head is. And it's also beneficial because if a predator is trying to strike a smaller fish in maybe the head, a blow to the head would be much more fatal. And so if they, you know, hit a, a smaller fish in the head, that fish is much more likely to die. However, if that smaller fish can trick the predator into, you know, into not knowing where um, the head is, and for example, hitting the tail, that fish is much more likely to survive that kind of blow. So we have a live example here of an Atlantic menhaden with that false eye spot. Another type of camouflage are the vertical stripes. Um, and so the vertical stripes are actually on several different types of fish to help them blend into a certain habitat. And that habitat is grass beds. So the aquatic grass beds kind of growing vertically up in the water column with these fish having these vertical stripes, they blend in a lot better to those grass beds. So we have a pumpkin seed fish here that is kind of an example of that. Finally, just simply having a mottled brown back, um, you know, spots or speckles or brown stripes on a fish really helps it blend into those bottom sediments, just kind of like that aspect of counter shading I was pointing out. So when they're on the bottom, some of these fish are bottom feeding fish. Um, they're much more likely to blend in. So we have an oyster toad fish here, a hog choker and a summer flounder, you know, flatter fish staying on the bottom, blending into those bottom sediments. So to kind of dive deeper into camouflage, we have two specific examples, that pumpkin seed fish again and the oyster toad fish. So the pumpkin seed with those stripes on its sides really adapted to blend into the grass bed habitats in the Chesapeake Bay, as well as the oyster toad fish. The name kind of gives it away a little bit with the oyster reefs or oyster rocks that that is the main habitat and hangs out. Um, around and so a lot of the markings on the oyster toad fish go really well with an oyster reef habitat. So these pictures I do want to say are taken um, in tanks or you know little aquariums where the fish were being held but now let's see what they look like in their natural environment. So we can see here we have the pumpkin seed 
kind of hanging out in the grass beds just as the background to show that it really does blend in really well with those grass bed habitats as well as the oyster toadfish in that oyster reef habitat really blending into those crevices of the oyster reefs. So with that being said, we're actually going to exit out of our slides again and Chris is actually preparing something a little surprise for us. She has a fish tank at home and we have several different species in this fish tank. So we want you all to take a look at this fish tank. If you can look real closely, some of these critters might be using camouflage and see how many different species you can count in this fish tank right now. How many different species you can count. And I do want to add, you don't have to identify the specific species. Um, just know that there's a difference and there's a variety in them. So how many different species? Ooh, and perfect timing, Morgan. You almost have it at exactly 12.24 on my clock. So we're going to do this for a minute. You have a minute to figure out how many different species you can see in this tank. And here's a hint too. Remember, uh, there are fish in here, but there are other, also other bay critters in here that may not be fish. All right, and we have five, four, five, four, seven, six, six, four, five, almost like I'm singing, one oyster. All right, five, four, six, excellent. All right, we're about halfway through our time. So I'm gonna help you all out by feeding these fish and see what happens. So just a reminder, you don't have to identify the specific type of fish, just seeing that there's a variety. Um, and this kind of points to the biodiversity of an area. The biodiversity is the um, amount of different species or the variety um, in an area. So we're looking for the biodiversity in this tank. All right, so it's like Christmas time for the fish now. Hopefully they are acting up a little bit more for us. And you can see now that they have a reason to come out of their hiding spots um, to risk themselves for a reason, you can see that they're exposing themselves a lot more um, and just how well their camouflage was working earlier. Um, in addition to hiding behind the shells and the rocks, um, some of them were probably hiding in plain sight. So now I see some of our numbers might be going up. Yeah, I love this activity too. Uh, Actually, no plenties in there. Ooh, nine. Um, yeah, a lot of naked gobies. They're very closely similar. Yes. So you can see lots of different fish in here. And again, identifying the specific species isn't super important for this one. Um, but another thing that we want you to note is where they're eating this food. So you see uh, there's that one little guy towards the top eating some food, a few others more towards the middle. And then on the bottom, uh, we have lots of bay critters enjoying their shrimp pellets. So noticing where they're eating this food is also telling of another adaptation that O'Shea is going to be covering, which is mouth placement. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Chris, for that demonstration. Um, so here we can get into what she just discussed, mouth placement. So here we have um, three different types of mouth placements. And um, I'm kind of going to demonstrate with my hands uh, how they um, actually are shown on these fish because uh, it's a little kind of confusing to um, just hear off words. So the first uh, mouth placement I would like to talk about is the terminal mouth placement. Um, so fish with terminal mouth, mouth placement, um, their mouth is usually in the middle or center of their head. Um, these fish either chase their food or feed on what's ahead of them. So their mouth, um, both top and bottom of their mouth are usually like this. As you can see, the top and the bottom of their uh, mouth are usually right there on top of each other. Um, so these terminal mouth positions are considered normal. Um, and most of these fish that have it in, uh, they usually are in the middle levels of the oceans or lakes. Um, so usually those uh, fish, term, uh, they're terminal mouths. Um, but if you think about it, those types of ad adaptations for terminal mouths, they tend to have to be a little bit faster because they have to chase their food. They don't have that chance to be able to come up or come down on them as I get into the other mouth. So next up, we have an inferior uh, mouth placement, which is usually lower. So instead of it being like this, it's almost like an overbite, like that. So their, their top mouth usually comes over their bottom. 
And these are usually bottom feeding fish, um, generally have an underslung, uh, their mouths located under the fish's head and uh, are adapted for scavenging and gazing on like algae or invertebrates. So as you can see, compared to the terminal, which was like this, any type of uh, fish with inferior mouth, they usually have that overbite with their mouth coming up. Um, and lastly, the superior, it's like the same thing, almost it's like an underbite. So their bottom lip kind of comes up above. And these, uh, these kind of fish usually have an upturned scope-like mouth, which is designed for, for feeding on prey that swims above the fish, uh, such as insects or plankton. Um, usually surface feeding fish, uh, they have, like I said, the upturned mouth, but however, though these superior mouth does not automatically signify a surface swimming fish, as we can show you examples ahead. Um, so like I said, terminal, you have this placement, inferior, it's more like an overbite, and then superior is like the underbite. And you, you will uh, tend to see these as we give you more examples. Um, next up, we have like a few pictures of this live picture. So uh, at our top left picture, we have a northern puffer. Uh, fun fact about those, they have teeth that grow continuously. Uh, they need to be continuously worn down by um, proper hard food items, you know, found in their wild diet. Uh, if the teeth do not wear properly, the pufferfish cannot open its mouth wide. And as you can see, that pufferfish kind of has that terminal mouth placement. It's like right there in front of their mouth. They kind of have to get their food straight ahead. Um, next, as you can see, the blending and the spot, they have that um, inferior mouth. So as you can see on the blending and the spot fish, it kind of like looks like it's a little bit below their eyes, like a little bit above, uh, below their nose as well and, and below their mouth. Um, so that's a great example for that as well. And the white perch and the pigfish, they show a great example of that terminal placement, where it's right in front of them as well, as, as, uh, just like that puffer. Um, also, another, another thing I want to point out about the pigfish is take a look at the dorsal fin. As you can see, there is someone holding this fish, so it feels a little threatened. And like I told you, like I uh, compared that dorsal fin to the roof of the car, um, once they feel that uh, type of threat, it tends to stick out. So there is a great example of showing its dorsal fin in action. If you try to like put your hand on that, any fish tries to bite down, bird tries to pick it up, it will easily get poked with that, as you can see there. And uh, last but not least, our oyster, our oyster toadfish. Um, as you can see, their mouth is kind of upturned. So it has that superior, superior uh, mouth placement. But um, if you guys remember how I said, however, that superior mouth uh, placement does not automatically signify a surface swimming fish. As you can see, the oyster toadfish are usually at the bottom, like Morgan was telling you guys, uh, and they usually feed on what is above them. Um, so next up, we have a great example, a live example of Atlantic silverside that Chris will display for you guys. And um, I'll kind of talk to you guys uh, with what you guys should look at. So um, it's a little hard to see. Um, as you can see, it's swimming around. Look at the mouth, pla mouth placement. It has that superior upper type mouth placement. Um, so the habitat is generally near the water edge, the Atlantic Silverside habitat. Um, they are mostly found swimming in brackish water, such as in the mouths of rivers and streams that connect to our oceans. Um, this is where you'll see a lot of like worms, zooplankton, shrimp, insects, and this is what they feed on. And uh, like I said, they don't have to be surface swimming fish. Um, also, if you can see a little bit uh, take a look at its forked tail. As you can see, the V shape, like I compared it to the engine of a car. Um, these fish are pretty fast and uh, it's a great adaptation for them as well. So um, speaking of fast fish, uh, this is a great transition into a game we have for you guys uh, to kind of get you guys interactive and going. Um, so we have our first game with uh, Chris. Awesome, thank you, O'Shea. So yes, we are going to play a game and we're gonna determine which of these fish is the fastest. But before we start, we wanna make a prediction first. So in the chat, what I want you to do is put in order from fastest to slowest that you think these fish are. Um, don't worry about typing out hog choker. Um, instead, just use that first letter. So for instance, SHM, MHS, um, but go ahead and make a prediction of, ooh, someone's really fast at typing, nice, um, of who you think the fastest is. So let's see. All right. 
Ooh, it's almost a tie between Menhaden and Striped Bass. Yep, really close. Excellent. Okay, well, you all can continue making your predictions if you'd like, uh, but let's start playing the game and see who the fastest is. So basically for this game, uh, the most points or the more points that the fish has, the faster it is. So on the left, we have illustrations of uh, the different body parts that O'Shea was talking to us about earlier. So we start with the caudal fin all the way down to the body shape. And then over to the right are actual photographs of these fish. So the first one we're going to break down is the striped bass. So looking at the illustration and then comparing it to the photo, I want you to put in the chat how many points you think that caudal fin is. So go ahead in the chat, how many points do you think that caudal fin is? All right, I am seeing a slew of twos. Great. Okay, so can we have the reveal, please? Dun, dun, dun. Yes, two is the right answer there. Um, looks almost exactly like that photo. Great. So the dorsal fin is a little bit trickier. Uh, you can see in the illustration, pretty nice designation between the spines and the rays. And in this photograph, um, there's also a pretty good designation between the spines in the rays. So go ahead and do the same thing with the dorsal fin. How many points do you think that one is? I'm getting some quick answers. All right, twos and threes. Great. Excellent. It's almost a tie between twos and threes. Let's see what it is. We have two. Yes, very, very close. Almost a two and a half, but that makes math too hard. So we're going to stick with two points for this one. Um, so we're going to do the same thing for that pectoral fin, like the steering wheel that O'Shea was talking about earlier. So go ahead in the chat, please say how many points you think that pectoral fin is. All right. I have a scattering of threes, mostly twos. Let's reveal the answer, please. Excellent. All right. Two points. Two points we have. So this last one is a little bit harder because the illustration is from an aerial view, whereas the photographs are more of a profile or side view. So what I want you to do is imagine that one point fish as the scared northern puffer or the stout oyster toadfish. And then that three point fish is going to look kind of like that Atlantic silver side O'Shea was just talking to us about. So go ahead with that in mind, how many points do you think that body shape is? All right, getting a lot of threes, twos, threes. And let's reveal the answer, please. Yes, all right. So we swear we didn't design it that way, but it is a straight shot, all twos. So two times four, we have a total of eight points for our striped bass. So keep that in mind. I'm gonna hand it over to O'Shea to talk about the hog choker. Sorry about that. Um, here, we're pretty much doing the same thing where we have the hog choker and we'll pretty much go through each fin. Um, so fun fact about the hog choker before we get started with this. Um, so the hog choker eyes, as you know, they usually start on, they are one, on one side. Uh, they usually, they actually don't start out on one side. Um, as they t get older, they tend to adapt to whichever side uh, they need them on the most. So that was a fun fact that I learned actually kind of getting this PowerPoint together for you guys. Um, so first, here we go. We have the caudal fin and like, like the one before, just put in, uh, into the chat which point you think it is, one, two, or three. Getting a lot of ones, a lot of ones. Drum roll, please. Morgan, can you please reveal that one? Correct. You guys are correct with that one. It is one. Um, Next up, we have the dorsal fin. Um, this can be a little tricky, but I think you guys pretty much got this one as well. Uh, between one, two, or three, go ahead and throw that into the trap. One, a lot of ones. Been a lot of ones across the board. Um, and we can reveal that answer as well. One, perfect, you guys, are, you guys got it. Um, okay, next up, we have our pectoral fin. Now pay, pay close attention to this one. Um, and go ahead and throw it into the chat which one you guys think it is. One, two, or three? Two, one, three. 
give you guys a few seconds for that one. Ooh. Okay, got a zero in there. And we can go ahead and reveal that one as well. Question mark. Okay, so for the hog choker, their pectoral fin, um, so this goes back to the adaptation. Uh, they have adapted to not needing that pectoral fin. They tend to not usually move around as much like uh, we were explaining earlier. They, they are very good at blending in and, and having that adaptation of not using it. So they have that unique pectoral fin where you don't see it, it's not there. Um, it's in a different spot. So uh, those of you that have said zero, you got that one correct. And last but not least, we're gonna switch it up for this one. I want you guys to guess the total amount of points instead of one, two, or three. Uh, so far we have two, so it's either gonna be three, four, or five. And you can throw that into the chat. What do you think the final number for this one will be? We have a couple of threes, five, I see one five. Some more threes, one four. And for the final answer, we can reveal that one, three. So those of you guys that said three are correct. As you can see, um, with, it, with it laying down flat, it's definitely wide, but in that aerial view, looking up, as you can see the body shape, it is very skinny. So uh, the total number of points for that one was in fact five. And uh, let's see if this is faster. It's obviously not faster than the stripe bass. Let's see if it's faster than the Manhattan. Next up with Morgan. Thank you, O'Shea. So final fish we're going to kind of analyze right now is the Menhaden. And so you guys are pros at this game. We're not going to break down all the individual points. So I want you to throw in the chat the total number of points you think the Menhaden has when you add up its caudal fin, dorsal fin, pectoral fin, and its body shape. So just as a reminder, that striped bass was at eight points. The hog choker was five. So what do you think is the total number of points for the Met Haven? We are getting in some answers. 12, 11, 10, 9, a lot of 11s and plenty of 12s. <laughs> Okay, so we're thinking it's a faster fish overall. So let's see what we have. Three points for that caudal fin, just like O'Shea was saying, having that forked tail is an indica indication of a very fast fish. So three points there. Three points for the dorsal fin. This one's a little tough because that dorsal fin doesn't exactly fit into really any of those categories, but really um, fast dorsal fin on the end. And then for the pectoral fin, three points, nice and long pectoral fin there. Finally, three points for the body shape, giving it 12 points overall. So men hidden at 12 points. So if we're kind of comparing all three of these fish here and how these fish are adapted to escape from predators, um, taking a look at that striped bass, eight points, pretty fast fish there. Um, but it does still require some type of cover. And so we've been calling it the striped bass, but you know, you might know that a local nickname for it is a rockfish. And it actually gets that nickname because sometimes those striped bass hang out near oyster reefs or oyster rocks. And so hence the name rockfish. So this fish is pretty fast. Um, however, it does prefer some sort of cover. So maybe hanging around that oyster reef or oyster rock. Next, we have the Menhaden. I, this is one of my favorite fish. Really cool, they have a lot of different adaptations. 12 points, it's a lightning fast fish. It has that forked tail. It's shaped like a little torpedo, really streamlined to cut through the water. Um, it also combines a few different types of camouflage. So it utilizes that counter shading. It also has that false eye spot, which is really cool. And another kind of like superpower I would say this fish has is that when it's swimming in a school with other fish, if they feel threatened by a predator or a predator is after them, they have the ability to release some of their scales into the water, creating what we call a glitter bomb. So they can glitter bomb the water, really confuses the predator, they're all disoriented, maybe the fish gets away. 
So really cool adaptations there. Finally, one of the coolest things about the menhaden, in my opinion, is that it's actually a filter feeding fish. So it swims through the water and it filters algae as it's swimming out of the water. And so it eats that algae. And so not only is that fish benefiting from eating the algae, but it's also improving water quality. So really cool adaptation there with that fish. So overall, it outruns its enemies. It prefers open water, um, that streamlined shape making it shaped like a torpedo, really great fish for 12 points there. So next we have our hog choker, um, five points. He's not the fastest guy in the bay. However, they are really cool because they're adapted to really blend in on the bottom, blended even with grass beds. They may not be fast, um, but they're really good at hiding and they do have those cool adaptations with the two eyes on one side. And you may be wondering why it's called a hog choker. So it's kind of a silly name. Um, and it's actually a story, historically, watermen or people that work the water would catch hog chokers, usually as bycatch or something that they weren't trying to catch, they just ended up with it. And they, they're not great to eat. There's not a lot of meat on these guys, they're pretty thin. And there's not, they're not really great bait either. So they weren't really sure what to do with these hog chokers. So oftentimes they were kind of a scrap fish and they would throw them to their hogs um, or their pigs. And so actually it points out an adaptation this fish has. And if you hold one in your hand and you kind of run your hand from its eyes back to its tail, kind of petting it, it's really slippery and slimy. So super slippery and slimy. However, if you reverse that direction and run your hand away from the tail towards the eyes, then your hand actually gets caught and it's almost like um, sandpaper. It's really rough, your hand gets caught. And so what would happen with these hogs is when the watermen would toss them to the hogs, sometimes they would choke on these fish. So giving it that nickname, the hog choker. So kind of a fascinating story there. But this fish is very good at hiding from en enemies, prefers abundant cover. It is a flat fish, um, very similar to the flounders, flat fish that lie on the bottom. So those are the three fish for us. And I'm gonna pass it to O'Shea to kind of bring it all together. Yep, thanks Morgan. Um, so just bringing it all together. So we went over a lot today, discovered uh, just how much we can learn about fish just by observing its physical features and habits. And as you guys said, you shared your stories about your uh, fish. Um, so the question I have for you guys, you can throw this into the chat. Why is it important to understand fish in order to save the bay? Again, why do you guys think it is important to understand fish in order to save the bay and kind of just to uh, keep it going while you guys get your answers together. Um, I can go in order from here. So like the hog choker, you know, it has this history with the bay. It's great repetition of camouflage, grass bay habitats, you got the striped bass, um, one of the top predators in the Chesapeake Bay, helping keep the food web and balance, uh, changes the number of um, striped bass could have lasting effects throughout the food web. And for the manhaden light, like Morgan just told you guys, um, it's ability to filter feed. They consume and redistribute a significant amount of energy within and between Chesapeake Bay and other estuaries. So uh, I see you guys are throwing it into the chat. Um, I'm trying to read it, but it keeps moving on me. Uh, if you save the fish, then you save the water quality and habitat, of course, um, need to know their needs, parts of the whole ecosystem, health indicators for the bay. So you got, this presentation was perfect. You guys uh, basically got what we wanted to give you guys. Um, it's important to know what types of habitat different species need to survive. Perfect. Um, the term in the bay is uh, vulnerabilities and potentials. Good, you guys got it. Um, we are uh, kind of getting low on time, so I want to leave you guys a few times for questions that you have for us. And uh, as you guys get those questions together, um, I think Morgan has a few pointers she wants to give you guys for the next slide as well. Thank you, O'Shea. So we do want to open it up for questions um, about fish and fish adaptations or the bay in general. And so while you all are putting those questions in that Q&A box, if you could, I'm going to point out um, some other adaptations. So we wanted to recognize we talked about body shape and camouflage and mouth, mouth placement. Um, but there are a lot of other adaptations that fish have. And so one really cool one um, is the sea robin here on the left-hand corner. And it actually has adapted to have little crawlers, like little legs to crawl along the bottom. Um, so that's a really cool adaptation. I think they're really cute. 
And then there's the blue fish, kind of a great example of that forked tail with a really fast fish. But the blue fish also has a really sharp teeth. So here's the mouth of that blue fish, really sharp teeth there. This fish is one of my favorites that we've caught. It is a northern stargazer. And so northern stargazers get their name because their eyes are at the top of their head. So they're looking up kind of like they're looking at the stars. And these fish have adapted to actually have a little part of their head that is electrocuting. Um, so kind of to ward off predators with that really cool aspect to that fish. And finally, just these two fish here, uh, the northern puffer and the striped burfish, blowing up to double their size to kind of trick their prey, as well as that striped burfish having those um, spines or spikes to defend itself. So just a few examples there, but wanted to go ahead and take a look at the Q&A box. Um, so a couple questions, is the hog choker related to flounders? They have very similar body shape. That's a great observation. So yes, they are, um, they're both flat fish. So yep, very similar to the flounders. Um, counter shading is a penguin's adaptation too. So I was getting to that, yes. The counter shading is in species all around us. So penguins is a great example, especially if they have a shark chasing after them. They need you know every part of help to blend in and get away from that shark. But um, sharks also actually have counter shading and whales, different types of birds, even blue crabs, um, any species that's kind of dark on top, light on the bottom uses that counter shading. So how do horizontal stripes rather than vertical stripes benefit a fish? So from my understanding, um, they do help blend in with, you know, maybe a rocky environment where you have different levels. So those horizontal shapes can kind of, um, stripes can blend into that different environment. But I think it's also important for schooling fish. So when schooling fish are swimming together and they have all those different horizontal stripes, um, it really like works well with the schooling behavior and how to blend in together and appear maybe bigger than um, just if they were swimming by themselves. Alrighty, other questions. Oh, so we have a great question about menhaden playing a significant role in filtering the bay's waters. Similar to the role we want oysters to play if we were able to get menhaden's populations numbers up to earlier historical levels. Um, so yes, I don't believe that they filter quite as much water as an oyster. So an adult oyster in ideal conditions can filter up to 50 gallons of water in a day, which is very impressive. However, I think a single menhaden probably couldn't do as much. However, when you put all of those menhaden in a school together, um, they are making an, a significant impact filtering the bay. So getting those numbers up would be definitely good for the water quality of the bay for sure. Other question, ooh, so we have a question about snake fish. So I believe you're talking about snakehead fish. Um, so snakehead fish, if you haven't seen them or heard of them before, they are an invasive species. They're not native to this area. And just like a lot of other invasive species, um, they become a, a negative impact because of their impacts on the natural ecosystem. So snakeheads, they can populate, repopulate really quickly. They spread really easily. Um, it's really sad. I actually was on Smith Island last year and they caught a snakehead all the way out on Smith Island in the middle of the bay. Um, so really sad to see they make a bit, they have really big impacts. Um, they can eat smaller fish, they spread really quickly and um, just an invasive species overall, so. Other questions? So what role does the bright silvery horizontal stripe on the striped bass play? So the horizontal stripe on the striped bass, I'm trying to think. So that, I'm, I think you're referring to like the bottom part because striped bass kind of have those spots up top. Um, just probably the reflection of the scales. Not sure if I can specifically picture the exact horizontal stripe you're speaking of, um, but just the, the striped bass having all of those little dots, they have like multiple spots on them um, and they blend in real nice around oyster reefs and things like that. So, Do I have any photos of the glitter bomb? I wish I did. I would love to 
capture that. That would be really cool. Um, and it happens pretty quickly. So it's like a quick glitter bomb in the water. I wish I had a, fit, a picture of it, but maybe there's a video on YouTube or something. Uh, there's a question in here. Um, how do humans have impact on fish adaptations? Um, they do, in fact, have an impact on fish adaptation. I think it's more so uh, like critical during like the early state uh, life stages of like many fish species. Um, like, so for example, like removal of like shoreline vegetation, um, like trees from river banks, uh, they decrease shade and increase water temperature. So stuff like that, uh, lack of vegetation also increase erosion of sediments, uh, which like alters their adaptations. It can, uh, even something as simple as fishing, uh, you're pulling out those um, different fish and it has those adapt uh, those type of effects and impacts on those fish adaptations. Pretty good questions in here. Let's see. So maybe time for one or two more. Um, do we have lionfish in the in the bay? That's another great example of invasive species down in the Caribbean and places like that. Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe we have any lionfish in the bay. I think we're a little too far north for that. Um, so that's good that we don't have to deal with the lionfish. We do have the snakeheads, however. So. Um, so as we're kind of wrapping up, thank you all for being such a great audience and participating. Um, so it looks like we have a question coming in. So if we're planning to have you present to our classes, would you all be doing the same with my kids as you did with us? So this is a great segue. Um, we wanted to allow some time for you all to ask questions about our OWL program, the on online watershed learning. So I'm gonna hand it over to Nora to answer any of those questions and address that. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, I'm a big snapper, so round of applause. For, um, I know that we can't see or hear you, but um, way to go, um, Morgan, O'Shea, and Chris. Thank you so much. Um, as you all can see, our expert CBF educators are a wealth of knowledge. Like, how about Morgan's awesome flashlight? O'Shea had your really cool fish mouth, so impressive. Um, the glitter bomb backed, and Chris, thanks for really bringing it home um, with that tank of fish. That was really awesome to see all all of those different fish kind of crawl out from their hiding spots. Um, so like we said in the beginning, the CBF OWL program um, is what CBF education is doing um, for this fall. So um, we have six different themes that you can choose from. So fish adaptations is just one of 18 lessons that we are offering. Um, so something that's a little bit different um, from the way that we did this webinar is that we know that teachers, you know, maybe you're using different platforms like Zoom, maybe you're using Google Classrooms, um, but we can come into the platform of your choosing um, and we hope that we can, you know, interact with your students. Maybe it's just in the chat. Um, maybe they can or do have the ability to unmute themselves. Um, so we are certainly um, encouraging participants participation, active engagement. Um, and again, as you notice, we're really think, um, hitting on all those different types of learning styles. So maybe you have some students that really are audio or visual learners. Maybe we have some students that want to like really um, move and get the kinesthetic learning going. Um, so all of the lessons that we offer with the CBF OWL um, program come with a few things. So the first thing is that our pod of educators, so that would be Morgan, O'Shea, and Chris, they're going to give you a call and you and the educators that you're working with will kind of um, talk about your students, you know, maybe what you're learning in class, um, how this fits in, um, how they can modify and adjust to meet you or your students' needs. Um, the other thing that they're going to do is kind of, um, you know, go through the different resources that CBF has, including the Learn Outside, Learn at Home um, curriculum that we've created. So these are vid videos that our educators have created this spring and this summer, and they also have um, a student investigation PDF. So this is something that you can send out to your students to do before or after the OWL, um, and we have a number of different resources, everything from fish adaptations to riparian buffers to water quality. So you name it, um, our educators um, are more than happy to modify and adjust to meet the needs of your students. Um, the primary target age that we're serving um, is middle and high school, but we certainly have elementary school groups that we can modify and adjust some of these presentations.
presentations um, so that they can fit the needs of your students. Um, the other thing is if you're a biology teacher or a teacher that maybe teaches two or three sections of the same class, say for example, you are a high school biology teacher and you have three sections of biology, our educators can come into those three sections as well. Um, and for everybody else who was asking earlier, um, if you registered for the webinar, we have your email. So tomorrow we're going to send you an email with links to the CBF OWL webpage, more information about how to sign up, and you will also um, have access to this recording. So if you wanted to look at it again, um, see how Morgan did that awesome counter shading demonstration with the flashlight, then you can check that out as well. So um, I know it's in the chat, but the website again is cbf.org slash OWL, O-W-L. And then again, check out the CBF Learn Outside website for more information as well. Um, that brings us to 12.59, um, just one o'clock. So again, thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, and tell your friends, if you have neighbors, friends, or family who are teachers, and this might be something that they're interested in doing, please spread the word. Um, we really appreciate your time today and let us know if we can answer any additional questions. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>